Uh, let's go through uh, the talk. It'll probably be about 30 minutes, and then there'll be plenty of time for, for questions. Uh, my co-author and I put together this idea, and we had a hard time doing it, uh, in large part because we haven't really found any alien life to study. So a lot of it uh, is based on the idea that we understand life on Earth and we can extrapolate. And I think that leads us to some conclusions that are relevant to those of us interested in uh, colonizing other planets. Uh, one term I want to get into before we get too far is, is that of the biosphere. And the biosphere is that part of a planet which uh, contains life. Here on Earth, uh, you can go down several miles and you'll find bacteria living in the, the crust uh, and it's very happy there. Uh, go down 100 miles and you probably won't find much. Uh, certainly the surface of the planet is covered with life. Oceans are covered with life. And if you go up uh, several miles into the atmosphere, again, you're going to find animals and, and bacteria. So that's the definition of the biosphere. Uh, it, it's you know, where life exists on a planet and how, how that life interacts with, it, uh, with itself. And the reason to putting, for putting together a, a talk like this is the, I don't know, the perception that uh, you know, colonizing other planets is a two-part problem. First you find a habitable planet and then you figure out how to get there. <clears throat> and when we say a habitable planet, we're talking about a second Earth, just like this one. It's going to have, you know, Earth normal gravity, uh, oceans, uh, you know, if it's a habitable planet, it's got to have oceans. Uh, it's going to have an atmosphere very similar to what we have here. Uh, that means, you know, probably green plants, hopefully friendly natives, tasty animals. And in other words, just move in ready. You, you figure out how to get there and then you can land and, and, and life is good. I think part of that is uh, due to the idea or the concept from Star Trek called the uh, M-class planets. Uh, who, who is not familiar with M-class planets from Star Trek? Okay, so several, all right, not too many. Uh, in Star Trek, uh, you know, Captain Kirk and, and friends were always running into M-class planets. And what that is is... Uh, a planet, you know, very much like Earth. Uh, people can breathe the air, uh, the temperatures are not too bad, and it's real good for film crews, you know, and, and you don't have to dress up in spacesuits. But it, it led to the, the narrative that there's a lot of planets like that out there, and it, it might be. Uh, part of this talk, we're going to have to get back into the evolution of life, and, you know, let's assume that we have a planet. Uh, with conditions very similar to our early Earth. On Earth, uh, life first appeared about four billion years ago. You know, in other words, as soon as conditions were somewhat favorable. And so, you know, based on that one data point, I guess we can assume that life is going to be fairly common. Uh, as soon as uh, conditions are somewhat favorable, you're going to have life, and then it's going to evolve over some period of time in, in some directions. So life of, uh, appears, it, it evolves. And we're going to run into it. Oh, let's see, oxygen. You know, a lot of, again, a lot of science fiction uh, stories, you know, they'll be wandering along and they'll find a planet with oxygen in there and, and, and there's no life. But if there's oxygen in the atmosphere, that is an indicator that you have life on the planet. Uh, oxygen is a waste product of photosynthesis. Um, again, this ability developed in, in plants uh, here on Earth about three billion years ago. So it, it, it took a while to get around to this, but it's a really neat trick. Uh, the bacteria, the algae, takes CO2 from the atmosphere, it takes water from the environment, takes light from the sun, and it makes carbohydrates, which is a really neat way to store energy for, uh, for the plant. And then animals that eat uh, plants also you know, get that, uh, that energy. But one of the waste products from that, of course, is oxygen. So if, if you have enough uh, algae or bacteria doing this uh, over a long period of time, you end up with what we have here, which is an atmosphere of about 21% oxygen. Now, if all the plants were to die today, you know, the oxygen would still be there, but it wouldn't be there for very long. Uh, came across a couple of studies that said uh, if the plants disappear, uh, it'll take several thousand years, but then the oxygen disappears. And we end up with a, an atmosphere of nitrogen and CO2. 
So if there's life, there's oxygen, or if there's oxygen, there's life. Uh, and if we have alien life, um, you know, suppose we find our Earth too, you know, it's a nice planet circling a, a yellow star, uh, you know, got good gravity, it's got oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere. Uh, and again, remember if there's oxygen and there's life in there or on the planet somewhere that's producing this stuff as a waste product, that means probably green plants, insects, animals, oceans, and, and so on. Um, assume we can get a colony ship there. You know, that's not a, a, minor, a minor problem either, but assume we get there, then the question is, can we move into our new home, you know, Earth 2? And I would submit that there, there's two considerations. One is ethical, uh, you know, can we move into someone else's home? And, and I'm gonna very carefully avoid that question. And the second one is, is there a compatibility problem of us moving into someone else's planet? Uh, again, we're jumping around a little bit here, but you know, there, there's a lot of threads that need to, need to be pulled together. Uh, building blocks here on Earth are the, uh, the amino acids. Uh, those you know, are the basic building blocks for, uh, for all life here on Earth. Uh, the Miller-Urey experiment, uh, I guess hopefully everyone here is familiar with that. They took some simple uh, inorganic chemicals uh, and water, ran it uh, around some apparatus, you know, had a spark in there. And over time, they developed uh, reasonably complex organic chemicals uh, consisting of, in, in some part, the, the amino acids. Um, there are about 300 naturally occurring uh, amino acids, and if you engineer uh, the molecule, you can probably make thousands more. So one of the assumptions I'm making is that uh, if we run into alien life on a planet, you know, similar to ours, it's going to use the amino acids as a building block, you know, just like us. And amino acids are very useful. Uh, in part because of their ability to form pe peptide bonds. Uh, if you take two, two amino acids and you hold them just right and you, you bang them together with just the right amount of energy, a couple of things happen. These atoms over here get together, form a water molecule, and, and wander off. The remnants create a peptide bond and two molecules become one. They get together, form water, wander off, and you have a peptide bond. Peptide bond is actually pretty strong. Um, you know, it's not going to break easily, but it can be broken. And you can do this again and again and again, and you end up with a polypeptide chain, with each one of these being an amino acid. And, you know, it's called a polypeptide chain. If it's over 50 amino acids in length, it's generally called a protein. And proteins are the amino acids, uh, you've heard of a carbon-based life form. Well, there's, there's the carbon. It's attached to an amino group here, an acid group here, a hydrogen here, and then a, a variable R group, uh, depending on what the function of the amino acid is. And amino acids can come in right-handed or left-handed versions. Uh, for some reason, Earth life has decided to standardize on left-handed versions. You know, if you make these things in a test tube, uh, in a lab, you're going to get roughly 50-50. But life, for some reason, has settled on left-handed versions of these uh, uh, molecules. And these are the 20 amino acids that uh, make up us. And worms and cats and dogs and bacteria. <coughs> and what is in blue is the, uh, the R group. And as you can see, it varies quite a bit. You know, this is not intended to be a biochemical lecture. You know, just get a flavor of what the amino acids look like. And here's another way to look at the amino acids. Uh, these 20 here are, are the same ones we saw before. The ones in green are known as essential amino acids. They're essential because we can't make them in our body. 
we have to uh, obtain them by ingesting uh, food, you know, plants, animals. Uh, they're composed of proteins. Our digestive systems take these proteins and they actually break uh, the protein down into its constituent amino acids. That's released into the bloodstream and then the bloodstream takes this around to all of our cells as, as part of the nutrient supply that it, it, it provides. So, essential amino acids. Now these ones over here we can make, but we can also obtain from plants and animals. Uh, and notice that there are three odd ones over here. This one is essentially the 21st amino acid that, that humans need, and, and we'll talk about that in a, a little bit. And these two over here aren't used by humans, they're used by bacteria and arachnids, of all things. So, here's the collection of old building blocks that life on Earth is made of. There were, 20, there were 24. There were three rows of seven and one row of three, but it said it was labeled 23. So. Yes, yes. But this is just a, a, a legend. So that's not really an amino acid, so. So, okay, trick question, but you caught it. Very good. Uh, proteins, uh, they're vital for life. Uh, that's what, uh, you know, membranes and structures inside the cell are made of. Uh, they're used to construct nanomachines uh, that operate inside the cell. They serve as messengers between cells. Uh, they're hormones. They're important to the uh, creation of uh, biologically important molecules. Uh, the body can break them down uh, and use them for energy, or the body can break down proteins and use them as amino acids that they then use to make other proteins. And the enzymes within the cell are in large part proteins. So this is who we are, proteins. Uh, the 21st amino acid, uh, most amino acids are, are pretty stable. This one is very reactive. And rather than floating around waiting to be used, it's essentially made on demand inside the cell. And it, what it is, it's a modification of the amino acid serine. And what we're doing, I need more hands here. here here's a selenium atom right here. And here's serine. What we're doing is replacing an oxygen with a selenium uh, atom. And there's uh, two or three enzymes that are important in, in this process. And again, this amino acid is made pretty much to order uh, for the cell. It's used in over 50 proteins, uh, so it's very important. Turns out that uh, lack of selenium results in a number of diseases where we are unable to make this amino acid, and that results in, uh, in sometimes death. Now, in East Tennessee, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, there's lots of selenium in the soil, so, you know, we pick it up on our food. But there's area in, areas in China where they're lacking it, and they've run into deficiencies related to this. So 21 amino acids for people, and then arachnids have another one, and there's, there's yet one more, I guess, for, uh, for bacteria. Uh, ribosomes. Uh, if you don't believe nanotechnology is possible, look inside the cell. This is a really neat machine. It uh, is, is, in essence, a protein factory. Uh, it's locate, located in the cell, but outside the nucleus. Uh, it reads a messenger RNA, which is created in the nucleus, floats out, uh, the ribosome grabs it, and reads it much like a punch tape. And this provides the information telling it how to build a protein. And so based on the information here, it'll grab a particular amino acid and you know, slam them together, making a protide, prota, uh, peptide bond. And you know, thus the uh, uh, polypeptide chain or protein emerges here. Uh, notice that the uh, messenger RNA is red, but it's not destroyed. So it can be used over and over and over. <coughs> this is a pretty big machine. Uh, the molecular weight is 4.2 million. The molecular weight of hydrogen is one, to give you some idea of how bi big this thing is. It's composed of 80 polypeptides slash proteins, 
and four strands of uh, RNA that actually come from the nucleus. And all these things are assembled into a machine that once it's assembled, is actually very stable and can generate uh, proteins for, for many years. So life is pretty remarkable. You say 70 or 80 years, is that what you're getting at? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. The books I read uh, didn't have any idea. My co-author didn't have any idea. Uh, you know, some you know probably go back to birth, uh, but you know, active cells have have a million of these things. You know, inactive cells have have far fewer. So there, there's a lot of them. Some of them are probably pretty old. Here's another artist impression of uh, a ribosome. This is the messenger R RNA being read and um, you know read and dispelled. Here's the protein that's emerging from it. And this thing can click along pretty quickly. Uh, again, the books I l looked at said that these things can assemble uh, the amino acids at the rate of four or five a second. So, you know, it clicks, clicks right along. Of course, it's on a very small scale, uh, but it clicks right along. But what happens when the messenger RNA calls for a a particular amino acid that's not available, uh, the, the process stops. And somehow it signals to the rest of the cell, hey, I, I need this, and it then begins to break down other proteins, hoping to free up the amino acid that this thing needs to uh, continue its work. And usually two or three proteins are destroyed for every one created. Uh, this is sometimes known as malnutrition. So alien biospheres, let's assume that the aliens use amino acids, uh, assume that they evolved along a different pathway, similar but different. Uh, Weber and Miller, uh, two researchers, uh, put out an interesting paper where they, they looked at the amino acids that are available in the pri primeval you know, soup of the earth and concluded that you know, based on simplicity and, and ease of, of manufacturing the things, that uh, an alien life form evolving under those conditions would probably use about 75% of the amino acids that, uh, that make, us, make us us. But that means 25% would be different, would be alien to us. And, and this is you know, an estimate, uh, you know, probability. Could be more, could be less. And also the number 20 or 21 is not uh, special in any way. They might actually use more amino acids. And if that's the case, then they're uh, so cellular machinery is going to have to be a lot more complex, but the resulting proteins could be more specialized and perhaps more efficient. So if you're looking for a superior race, maybe they just have more amino acids. So carbon-based aliens, here we go. Um, if we run into them, if we're running around an alien biosphere, you know, suppose they have lots of fruit and animals, you know, that we can eat. Uh, in all likelihood, or there's a possibility, perhaps a good possibility, that they won't have all of the essential amino acids that, that we need. And if you don't have the amino acids, if, if it's essential, uh, we can't make it and, and we die pretty quick. Uh, there's also a 50-50 chance that uh, they're going to standardize on a different handed version of the amino acids. You know, I said that the life has, has standardized on left-handed amino acids. If they standard on, standardize on right-handed amino acids or some mixture, we won't be able to use any of those amino acids to uh, construct proteins. You know, it's like having the wrong glove. You know, left-handed glove won't fit on the right hand. Just, just, just doesn't work. So the conclusion is if, if you're a human running around on an alien world, you know, trying to exist in their biosphere, in all likelihood you're going to you know, suffer malnutrition and, and probably die. Uh, a couple of ways to get around that, uh, nutritional supplements, uh, you can bring food with you, maybe you can plant earth food on the alien world and then you exist off that, or you can modify people uh, to be consistent or, or, or compatible with uh, the alien world. But it's not just a matter of malnutrition, it, it could be uh, something worse. One example is the amino acid muscazone. A muscazone is an amino acid produced by some mushrooms. It turns out to be a toxic psychoactive chemical. 
Uh, the mushrooms don't use it for anything except self-defense. Uh, it discourages animals like us from, from eating them. So it is pretty effective in, in that arena. But if you eat a couple of mushrooms, you're getting microgram quantities. But imagine if the alien life form is using this as one of their standard amino acids. Uh, then in, instead of getting microgram quantities, if you had an alien steak, you're getting gram quantities of a, a toxic psychoactive material. And this looks a, a lot like, you know, some of the other amino acids, uh, you know, that I showed earlier. You know, it, it's not one that we use, but it might be one they use. Another problem is uh, uh, analogs. This is the analog of lysine. Lysine looks just like this, except this is a carbon. So it's very similar to, to lysine. This is a, an artificial, not an artificial, a man-made uh, amino acid uh, developed here fairly recently. They think it has uses in, uh, in drugs and, and other areas. Um, but what, what they've noticed is if you grow cells in the presence of this amino acid, uh, the cells are not as viable as normal cells. And what we think is happening is the ribosome has never run into this before. It can't tell the difference. So sometimes it gra uh, grabs lysine, sometimes it gra grabs the analog, but they're not the same. The, the protein will not function as well, may not function at all, and so therefore the decreased viability. And all of the amino acids that we have have, have analogs that uh, the ribosome may not be able to differentiate. Pheromones and pollen, you know, here on Earth they're very useful. Uh, pheromones uh, for communication between organisms and pollen as a way for plants to transmit uh, genetic information back and forth. But on an alien world, you know, they're probably going to develop the same abilities, but their pheromones and pollens are going to be alien. And perhaps, you know, maybe it's going to be harmless to humans. Maybe it's going to be similar to ragweed. Maybe it's going to be ragweed squared. You know, perhaps it's psychoactive. We, we just don't know. And if there are any writers out there, just imagine if it's a toxic nerve agent. Make a, an interesting story. Uh, glyphosate lesson. Glyphosate is a modification of the amino acid lysine. And... You know, it's the active ingredient in, in Roundup. It's real good at killing weeds. And what it does, it interferes with some enzymes that are necessary for uh, plants to generate uh, the amino acids that they need. We can ingest plants and animals and essentially steal their amino acids, but plants have to produce all of, their, all of the amino acids that they, that they use, uh, except for the carnivorous flytrap. You know, it, it, take some from flies. Uh, but for the most part, you know, plants have to make all of their own amino acids. This one, this chemical interferes with a couple of enzymes necessary for the production of a number of amino acids that we need, or that they need, and thus they die. The trick is they've modified the food plants, you know, the wheat and whatnot, to use a different pathway so they're unaffected by uh, glyphosate. And humans don't use the pathway either, so the, in, the enzymes we have are not affected by this. Uh, but there's gut bacteria you have which, which is affected, so you're not totally off free. So you shouldn't be consuming Roundup. Uh, and I guess the lesson here is it's possible to have chemicals in an alien world that might interfere with the molecular process inside our cells and there's no way to, to know what uh, we're going to run up against. Uh, you know, these are specific problems of, uh, of a general problem, which really is xenobiotics. It's known as xenobiotics. Xeno is stranger in Greek. Xenobiotics are compounds that are strangers to our biosphere. PCBs are a good example of that. Uh, you know, in the 40s, that was recognized as a, a wonderful chemical, you know, very stable, uh, non-combustible, non-flammable, uh, good heat transfer characteristics, apparently very useful in paints. You know, wonderful chemical, had a lot of good properties, but if it got into the human food chain, uh, bad things happened. Today there's over 200,000 xenobiotics uh, that have been developed in the last 100 years here on Earth, 
and you've heard some of the horror stories of what those have led to, but we have government agencies, you know, looking at these things, and if they're harmful, they're, they're in theory pulled off the market. So we have some protection against xenobiotics here, but if you're wandering around uh, on an alien planet in an alien biosphere, uh, again, it evolved along a completely different pathway, you're, you're, you're exposed to thousands, perhaps millions of xenobiotics. And the consequences, again, are, are somewhat unknown, but uh, it kind of boils down to the question, how lucky do you feel? So an alien biosphere offers a lot of opportunities uh, for bad things to happen. So we can learn a lot by studying alien biospheres. We can learn a lot by studying alien cell structures. That's one reason it's important to get into space and actually look for alien life. Uh, there's lots of lessons to be learned from that. Uh, we do have to address ethical and safety questions if we want to try to colonize an alien biosphere. Can we do it? You know, maybe yes, maybe no. But uh, at least for those of us interested in trying to colonize this distant stars and other planets, we're probably looking at uh, space settlements and terraforming as the uh, way we're going to operate. Okay, here's a nice image of a planet undergoing terraforming. Here's a nice image of a planet that has undergone uh, terraforming. But is terraforming practical? Yes, but it will take a suitable planet, you've got to find one, hopefully one that's sterile, and if it's not sterile, you've got to deal with the ethical issues of sterilizing it, uh, which, again, we're going to avoid. Uh, colonists will need some place to live in the meantime. It requires a creation. Terraforming essentially is the uh, transportation of the biosphere here on Earth to another planet, and that's the bacteria, the fungus, the uh, insects, uh, you know, the animals, the fish, uh, the plants. You know, we might be able to leave some behind, you know, like uh, ticks and mosquitoes and, and leeches, but, you know, essentially all life is going to be transported to this new world. And we'll create our, our Earth, too, rather than moving into one uh, that someone else has, uh, has created. So at the end of the day, at the end of the process, yeah, we'll have a place to live. But also, all the life that we've uh, evolved with will have a place to live. So that's, that's the talk. And uh, at this point, I guess I'm ready for any questions. Sir. If the planet is sterile, wouldn't you assume that it would be hostile to the to life or to the formation of life or not have an atmosphere or it lost its atmosphere like Mars mostly? due to uh, changes in uh, magnetic activity, loss of the magnetosphere, things like that. Yes, yes, absolutely. It'll, it'll be very hostile to uh, human beings. Any human that sort of walks out, you know, very much like Mars. You know, if you walk out on the surface of Mars, you'll last, uh, what, about 30 seconds? So, yeah, it is going to be very hostile. But the process of terraforming is to eliminate that hostility and create a Earth-type biosphere where people could walk outside just like here and, and exist just fine. Kent? It takes a lot of, to, to uh, trans, transplant an ocean to another planet. Well, you don't have to transplant the whole ocean. You, you just find a lot of water somewhere, and usually in the outer solar system there's lots of water, but you will have to transport life from Earth to colonize the, uh, the ocean. Kent? Now, do you think people who are saying we have to, you know, essentially move to other planets, people like Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, do you think they, they're aware of this kind of thing, you know, possible incompatibilities of amino acids and things? You would have to ask uh, Stephen Hawking. I, I suspect he, he's aware of it, but just because there's a problem doesn't mean that there's not a solution. And I think terraforming is probably the solution that I would propose. There may be other ways to get around it, but it is an issue that needs to be, you know, factored in. Because I, I tend to think that the issue more often is how do we get there? You know, the, the technology to get us to these places, and not so much, okay, what is it we're going to be dealing with when we get there? 
Yeah, I, I've avoided the ethical question and I've avoided the uh, transportation problem uh, because both of those are, I think, pretty hard. They're in the back. Assume a sterile planet 8,000 miles in diameter to give you one Earth normal gravity. What kind of energy budget do you project for terraforming that? Uh, a lot more than we have now. But keep in mind, if we can transport, uh, you know, a, a massive uh, world ship from here to there, we're dealing with the kind of energies that we need to, uh, to terraform. So can we do it today? Can we terraform Mars today? No, uh, just because of the energy constraints. But you're, you're exactly right. Uh, John. I uh, really appreciate everything you've said. To me, it underlines the importance of close examination of all of the planets and satellites in our own solar system. I mean, you've alluded to the fact that, well, not Mars itself may be sterile, and that's very important. But then we're already debating whether uh, Enceladus and Europa uh, may have uh, life beneath the frozen surfaces and, and so forth. And uh, hearkening back to when I was very young, I used to read uh, John W. Campbell uh, science fiction, and he assumed that since we already knew that the, the gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune uh, were full of carbon compounds and, and an enormous range of, uh, of uh, conditions uh, that uh, there may be life forms that uh, are floating in, in the atmosphere at just the right levels. And, and so uh, exploration of uh, our own solar system and uh, determining what's there and, and what, which of these processes have predominated is vital to the whole question of what happens when we get elsewhere. Yeah, again, one of the problems with trying to put together a talk like that, like this, is we don't have any data on what an alien life form or life system is going to look like. We don't know how it's going to be put together, and especially if you're looking at some of the, uh, you know, moons of the gas giants where they're going to live in an ocean covered with a, uh, uh, you know, thick layer of ice. You know, that's very alien to anything we understand. And so I, I think it's imperative to get out there and, and look around and, and see what we can learn. And there's a lot we can probably learn in our own solar system. Even if Mars is sterile, it may have been that life evolved on it and then died out. It may be that life, uh, you know, evolved or, uh, you know, arose on Mars and then it was transported to Earth. You know, we, there's one theory that we're Martians, uh, that all life on Earth comes from Mars. So, you know, getting out there and figuring out what's going on, I think, is, is imperative because, hey, in this universe, what you don't understand can really, really kill you. Okay. One, express one other opinion. Uh, the, uh, for years and years, we always assumed that oxygen was the indication of life because we assumed that photosynthesis was uh, essential. And then we discovered the uh, uh, worms uh, under those rifts and uh, the fact that uh, life uh, certainly appears to be able to live in a completely alien environment there. And we would assume that that's inside of Europa and, and uh, mm -hmm. Enceladus. So uh, you have to broaden the definition of life accordingly too, because it may be conceivable that um, something could exist uh, in the observable atmosphere which would still not be free oxygen. Yeah, keep in mind, uh, life existed on this planet for close to a billion years before it figured out how to uh, do photosynthesis. So life can exist very comfortably, you know, without an oxygen atmosphere. And uh, yeah, your point's well taken. But. But if there's oxygen, you know, I guess my contention is there's probably life on that planet somewhere pumping out oxygen. Uh, so, okay, David? It would be really nice to have an instrument that we could drop or in place on Europa or, or uh, a distant Earth to Pluto to analyze for the presence of different types of amino acids, what they might be, what might be the distribution. Some distributions would suggest patterns of life. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any uh, 
attempts at designing such an instrument? How big would it be? What would be it? It's like a mass spec, maybe. That just tells us basics. Yeah, basic uh, elements. So how small, how compact, how simple can, uh, can such an instrument be? Well, again, remember the argument uh, I made that nanotechnology is indeed possible. Uh, you know, it exists inside our cells, so therefore I would think that you could build a fairly sophisticated instrument, very small, you know, maybe the size of a, a dime, using nanotechnology. But nanotechnology has its own, its own dangers, so yeah. Okay, gentlemen here. You hypothesize a sterile planet. The Earth presumably, in some sense, once was sterile, but it was colonized. What is the chance, do you think, that there will be a sterile planet which has already been colonized by the process which colonized us? Because that's been going on for as long as we have been, as long as the Earth has had life. So the chance of us getting there first strikes me as zero. So that is one open question. Uh, how common is life uh, throughout the universe? No, but the, 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 the means of transmission of life which brought it to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sort of delves into the panspermia theory. You're, you're familiar with that? The idea that life evolved one place in the universe and then spread out from there. Uh, so every uh, life system we're going to run into is, is essentially based on the, the same set of blueprints. That's so, like uniqueness with the sun. Yeah, yeah. Um, some very good questions. Uh, it, you know, you, you ask some very good questions. I, I can't really answer them, again, because we don't have any real data to go on. It may be life is very, very common that we won't find any sterile planets, uh, in which case we may have to sterilize it and then proceed with the terraforming process. Uh, but hopefully we can find some naturally sterile planets, you know, perhaps like Mars. Mars appears to be very sterile right now, uh, you know, just working off that. Or, you know, far-fetched, I guess you could actually begin to think in terms of uh, building your own planet. You know, it's interesting to note that, uh, you know, if you collided uh, Venus and Mars together, you'd end up with a planet about the same mass as uh, Earth. And you'd get rid of all that pesky CO2 on Venus as well. So, yeah, building planets is not, uh, not too insane. Okay, David? This is, this is a weird question. I guess starting about a month ago, we had for the first time in all our written history, all our history, the realization that there's something from probably outside our solar system now passing through the solar system. And based on its velocity, it easily would escape the solar system. So probably it came from a very distance. Have you seen any, any really credible way that we could use the technology that we already have in place to, uh, to reach this asteroid or whatever it is that's passing through our solar system. Oh yeah, I mean, we've gotten probes to uh, Pluto and, and beyond, and uh, I think the challenge there would be the velocity that, th yeah. that this thing has as it zips through the, uh, the solar system, but uh, the Starshot people are, you know, talking about accelerating uh, research craft up to 20% the speed of light, so if that's possible, we should be able to, uh, you know, catch up with this thing you know, and, and circle it with uh, probes, and, and the probes will then go with it. But, uh, yeah, the more we learn, uh, I think the better off we are. Right now we're, we're speculating in the dark, and that's an uncomfortable position to be in. Let me come back to you a little bit. If you suggest that life originated in one place, but it reached us, mm -hmm. therefore with it, we are within its sphere of influence, if you like. Mm -hmm. We've got to overtake it to find a sterile place. I don't think it came from anywhere except it originated here. I mean, it's just a matter of chemistry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the panspermia theory is, is just a theory. And it may be that life, once it originates somewhere, 
you know, will spread throughout maybe the uh, its solar system, you know, and, and it only makes the problem worse. I mean, your hypothesis is find a sterile planet. Well, no, that's part of the solution. <coughs> um, you know, first of all, find a sterile planet. I like sterile planets because you avoid the ethical issues of uh, looking at a planet that is, you know, has life on it. <coughs> and if the compatibility problem is real, the only solution is, you know, we live in space habitats or we sterilize the planet and then proceed from there. I believe the discussion has gotten a little bit off the mark. Linda brought up the right point that uh, uh, the, the other alternative to panspermia is that life spontaneously occurs everywhere that you, you have the right raw materials and the right, uh, right, right. energetics and, and um, so uh, which seems uh, more likely uh, that, than panspermia and, and so so uh, and, and it's uh, in uh, accord with the Miller-Urey experiment that you mentioned originally the things that Cyril Pana and Peruma did after that. And, and so uh, it, it, there's a, a very strong case for the creation of the proteins and stuff uh, spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very good questions.